worn watch crossbowmen are kitted out with male shirts augmented with plate, long swords instead of the traditional daggers or short blades of most archers, and unique crossbows. Indeed, they undergo more training to battle enemies in melee than most archers ever see. That said, the crossbow is their primary weapon, itself capable of puncturing even heavy armor, and wise commanders will employ them appropriately. Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name's Brian, and in this video we're going to be covering one of the more recent releases for A Song of Ice and Fire, the miniatures game, uh, and that's going to be the Thorn Watch for House Baratheon. So in the box we end up getting six unique sculpts, and one of those is going to be a special attachment, the Thorn Watch Sentinel. I'm pretty sure it's the Thorn Watch Sentinel. Yep. <laughs> and uh, taking a look at their card, uh, for seven points we get a, a Renly Loyalty unit. And it's a good thing because we've been wanting uh, something else besides Rose Knights for quite some time now. So we've got something else for Renly to kind of mess with here. So flipping over to the front of the card, we have a uh, movement of six. They have a short range uh, attack uh, called Watcher's Crossbow that hits on threes and the decay stat is 663. For their melee attack, they have the long sword that hits on fours and has a 754 decay stat. They have a five plus defense save and then a six plus morale. On the Watcher's Crossbow, they provide the rule Sundering, so you get Sundering on your shots, which is nice. They also have Swift Strike that's tied to their melee attack. Uh, that states, after this attack is completed, you can perform one retreat action. Innately, they just have the ability regroup as well. So after completing a retreat action, they restore two wounds plus one wound for each of its destroyed ranks. So I think uh, a couple people might not be super jazzed about this unit when you first look at it. For seven points, they only have short range. Their shooting is really good, but... Um, you know, hitting on threes is nice, having sundering is nice, six six three is a decent stat, but, um, you know, only at short range is kind of rough. Swift Strike is, you know, the, the, there's some confusing rules on this, on this card when you first kind of look at it, but after you kind of digest what's going on here, the, the unit is meant to really be a multifunctional unit, kind of like one of those jack-of-all-trades, master-of-none type deals. They're very much a, a skirmishy unit. They want to be up in the business, kind of running around doing weird stuff because they've got that six uh, movement stat. And they do come with some of that more Tyrellish uh, sustain with being able to get out of combat after making their attack. And then once they do that, they can uh, heal some wounds to uh, getting ready for like a, you know, the, something neat that you could do with these guys is charge, uh, do your attack, maybe have some cool, uh, some cool, uh, Baratheon cards played on them to make that attack a little bit more painful, and then retreat out, heal your wounds if you have any lost, and then when your next turn comes around, you can take the swords to shoot or something, because maybe they were the only things that were engaged in combat. So I think there's a little bit more to this unit than meets the eye. I think they're one of those things where, once you get them on the table, you might... Uh, you, you might see a little bit more out, or you might start to realize kind of what their role is or what their purpose is. Looking over at the Thornwatch Sentinel, for one point we get uh, an attachment that gives the rule Dauntless, so each time the unit passes a morale test it restores one wound, and then he also brings a Pathfinder, so this unit ignores dangerous, hindering, and rough keywords. So I think the Thornwatch Sentinel isn't terrible to put on the Thornwatch unit. It's one point which isn't much for an attachment, but making this unit an eight-point unit is kind of weird. You really have to get a lot of work out of the rules you're bringing on him, or on the Thornwatch Sentinel, to make sure that the unit's getting some work done. And Dauntless is more of a defensive ability, and Pathfinder can be offensive, but is also very situational because, you know, you might not have any of these keywords showing up in the places they want to be. So uh, I think the Thornwatch Sentinel might have some more interesting places, like maybe you could throw them on a unit of Rose Knight, again making another expensive unit more expensive but um you know he kind of played the Thornwatch sentinel kind of plays into some of the things that the uh the rose knights want to do um whenever they pass their morale test they restore a wound triggering deadly bloom so it would do a, a wound back to your opponent it would just make it makes it so that your your opponent's going to be taking a lot of damage from the rose knight unit uh, when it's not really um when it, when it's not there when it's not your activation the other thing too about rose knights is their speed four and they do hit on f uh they well they hit on threes i guess so that not a big deal but um speed four makes it so that you really don't want to be dealing with any of the um 
the funky keywords. Dangerous, I don't think they really care if they ignore it or not, only because um, they can restore wounds quite easily. But going from 7 to 5 is a pretty steep decay in the first place, so trying to keep them as full as possible probably is in your best interest. So I don't think the Thornwatch Sentinel is a, a bad call for the Rose Knights to be attached to. It's just probably not the one that I'm going to reach for first. So what kind of things do we want to try and get onto the uh, the um, Thorn Watch? So I, I was kind of flipping through stuff because I've, I've been really kind of itching to play some Baratheons lately, and I think that the Thorn Knights kind of piqued my interest a little bit. And I have a couple different commanders that they could go with, but I'm going to start with one of the atta with the attachments, and we'll go to commanders later. But um, the first one I wanted to talk about was going to be Courtney Penrose, the uh, Loyal Tactician. So for two points, he ends up bringing the order tactical reposition, so you can trigger this at a start of an enemy turn. Uh, you target one friendly unit within short range, and then they perform a three-inch shift. So that can be the Thornwatch unit itself. So that gives them just a little bit more of a extension on their threat range for shooting if you wanted to get them into places. The other thing that he does is he brings the, uh, the rule orders of the crown. Each time a friendly NCU claims the crown, you can replace that uh, zone's effect with Courtney Penrose's unit can perform one maneuver or march action. So I know that this means that Courtney would be in the unit, and then we're taking it to a nine-point unit. But I think with the extra threat extension that you get from these and the, the amount of speed that can be brought with the Thorn Watch, it's not the worst call in the world. It's it's definitely something you really got to think about, um, and maybe it's more cute than good. But I think uh, it's it's interesting to kind of give that kind of mobility to a list that has been uh, historically a little bit slower. Um, otherwise, one of the other attachments that I really enjoy on the uh, the Thorn Watch is going to be the uh, Pikeman Captain. And uh, for one point, you just get Boldness and Courage, which, you know, it, Boldness and Courage is a pretty dang good ability. But if we take a look at the stats on, well, for those who aren't, you know, aware, Boldness and Courage modifies both your ranged and uh, melee attacks and states that each time uh, this unit attacks, if it has full ranks, it gains plus one attack die. Otherwise, it's treated as having plus one rank for attack dice. So thinking about what the stats look like on those Thorn Watch, they would go to uh, seven dice on their on full rank shooting then they'd have six and six so they would be dangerous up until the bitter end boldness and courage on things like uh halberdiers or pikemen in general or uh um crossbows is really nice because uh you do get to make them go the distance and your opponent has to commit resources to getting rid of them because they can't afford to let them just sit around all game and do whatever they want to uh and you know give get that opportunity for you to heal them up a little bit looking at their melee stat things get a little bit more interesting uh 754 is you know the exact same decay that rose knights have talking about those and people think about them as more of a combat oriented unit so we then go to eight seven five for the uh the attack uh decay on the thorn watch for melee and i think that's pretty decent considering they hit on fours that kind of fixes the issue of them uh getting that 50 50 ish roll to hit so i think the pikeman captain is definitely one that uh i have my eye on when it comes to attaching things to the thorn watch if i'm just wanting them to be really effective and do uh do some work Shifting gears over to commanders, I do want to mention Courtney Penrose, uh, Castlin of Storm's End, uh, again, or well, his commander version, right, instead of his attachment. But um, bookkeeping is a really uh, legit rule in general. Um, Parathians do have some pretty interesting cards that they want to keep filtering through, so the more you can draw, the better, um, especially when you take a look at what Courtney's bringing to the, or Courtney, I don't know, however you want to say that, is bringing to the, to the table. Orders of the Crown, he keeps that still, so you can go ahead and uh, keep this um, unit more maneuverable if you decide to put uh, Penrose in them. Uh, so he, he doesn't give them the extra shift extension, but um, if he wasn't in that unit, uh, you've got issue commands can help the Thorn Watch if they need to do extra things. Or if he is in the unit, issue commands can make it so that the Thorn Watch, once they've done what they've needed to do and maybe collapse a side or take some like flanking threats out, then Courtney Penrose can go ahead and issue commands to make sure that he's not wasting his activation, just kind of leaving an important part of the table to go do something with those Thorn Watch. Um, in addition, Counterplot and it is an amazing card. Um, if your opponent finds that 
the thorn watch are going to be a little bit more painful trying to stop any kind of shenanigans they might want to play on them seems like a pretty decent deal i think courtney penrose is like uh, one of the better uh, commanders that the renly side has available to them so it's very difficult for me to ever not think that a unit will be good with him but if we want to dive a little bit deeper into uh into the commanders that i think are a little bit more interesting with them or at least the commander i like a lot is going to be um renly baratheon lord paramount of the stormlands so this is renly 2 i would call him the helmeted renly uh he ends up bringing an ability that can't be stripped at all um called boisterous charisma uh and it states that this unit may never be targeted by order or enemy orders tactics cards or be affected by enemy ncus um, he also brings the stalwart ability, so the unit gets plus two to their morale test rolls. So when it comes to like putting him on the Thorn Watch, you're for sure not going to be messed around with with your opponent for the most part because they really can't do much to touch them. It's almost kind of like having a pseudo counterplot always attached to them um, which you know it's not the same exactly but it still does quite a bit for them and they do get to take quite a bit of advantage of having that stalwart ability because uh you know they um they already have that six plus morale and panic is just another way to start doing work to to units and since you're not getting the pikeman captain on there uh you want to try and you know make sure that they're staying nice and healthy and not losing out plus like you know your opponent can't find some low-hanging fruit and trying to get your commander through a lot of panic damage but taking a look at the cards that uh, Renly Lord Paramount brings, uh, the first one is Inexplicable Return, and this just triggers when a friendly NCU claims a zone you can replace that zone's effect with, uh, either moving one friendly attachment from one unit to another unit within long range, or getting a previously destroyed attachment. So there isn't really any... Um, innate synergy here with the uh, Thorn Watch, but... Um, the uh, expert duelist ability is quite prevalent and can be quite devastating. Uh, you know, not to mention people are just removing up, removing points from your unit for uh, a three plus. But um, you're you're also you're trying to put attachments in your units to make them better. So finding your opponent trying to find ways to make them. Uh, worse and have you playing down those points is not something you want to have happen. You could do some things like shuffling some guys around or shuff shuffling some attachments around uh, if you wanted to make sure you got the boisterous charisma ability into another unit that might need it. Um, you could you could kind of see see that being a, a decent thing that you could do um, just to kind of you know be a little tricky. Uh, otherwise, Hidden Affairs is an interesting one for him. This is after a friendly unit not containing Renly Baratheon is attacked. Renly's uh, unit performs one attack or charge action on the attacker, and it rolls its highest attack die value. Also, you can start of a friendly turn draw a card instead if you don't, don't have Renly hanging around. Uh, it's kind of just like a get-out-of-jail-free card if you get stuck with this in your hand and Renly's gone. But uh, this rule or this card's pretty decent on the if you've got Renly in the Thorn Watch, because they're both threatening for shooting and threatening for charging. So no matter what, you're going to be getting something cool out of this. And if the Thorn Watch are doing what you really want them to do, which is kind of playing the flanks and being a little more tricky, they can start getting people from the side and having side sundering shots is uh, something that is pretty decent. You know, if you're 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 thinking that you're a decent armor save or defense save at three plus, getting shot in the side with a bunch of sundering arrows is going to pull you down to that five plus and that's no no fun no one wants to be there next up he gets in his brother's shadows and this just triggers when an enemy commander activates or enemy can commander's unit activates sorry you can choose one if that enemy's in long range of Renly's unit, they lose all their abilities until the end of the round, or Renly's unit uh, performs a maneuver or retreat action. And then, uh, alternately, if the opponent's commander is destroyed, Renly's unit can restore two wounds. So, if you've done the work you needed to, you can always get wounds back into the Thorn Watch unit. But, again, you're either stripping your opponent's commander abilities, which is pretty decent, because they are just a free attachment that brings cool stuff they can do. But the other one on here is that Renly can perform that maneuver or retreat action. And this, the Thornwatch Sentinels really like to be shifting around the table a lot. So this is a really good 
a really good thing for them to be doing is like, you know, once they've got in those sides, they can try and close gaps and remain effective because they do have such a short threat range. This is a way to make sure that you can get that to happen. So if you do something like bring Renly Lord Paramount as your commander and then have Courtney Penrose and another unit hanging around, the Thornwatch Sentinels can get pretty nasty with being able to shift around a bunch. Not to mention Courtney Penrose is a, a free three inch shift is almost like a free maneuver for uh, a lot of the more tanky units like the Rose Knights or the Wardens. So it's just good in general for Baratheons. Now I think uh, kind of looking at the the round off of what we what we see. Oh, you know what? Never mind. I want to say one more thing that uh, when you have Renly two, you're also you also open up the uh, uh, effectiveness of. Um, Brienne the Blue. So, like, after Renly's uh, unit is ever attacked, wherever they are on the table, she can perform uh, an attack, or she can perform a charge action on the attacker. So, this is just, you know, another way to make sure you can kind of have, like, a buddy cop duo of uh, Thornwatch Sentinels and whatever combat unit you want to put Brienne in. If you want to get really sticky, uh, you could go ahead and put um, her in a unit of Sentinels, so you could have the charge action happen with her, and then have Sentinel happen afterwards, like if it's a one-two punch type thing. But that's that's probably a little bit too many eggs in one basket. Uh, so, like, I just think that she's once you grab a Renly, she's a pretty decent uh, a decent one to include, even though she only costs one point instead of zero now. I still think she brings a valuable uh, ability to the game, although. I can kind of see the argument for thinking that you wouldn't want to because when Renly's gone, then it's not really that great. But uh, you, since you have the uh, inexplicable return, uh, you can make sure that Renly stays on the table a couple more times if for whatever reason he starts falling off. But um, so I want to kind of circle back to my overall thoughts on the Thornwatch. And, you know, they don't, they, the, the, their, their combat prowess seems to be really centered on their, uh, ranged attack but when you look at the cards for the uh for the baratheon's uh tactics deck that's just base we do get a lot of really cool things that uh help modify them so we, we don't want to look at the thorn watch in a vacuum we want to try and look at the things that the game can bring for them or that there's they just happen to be in the situation of because they're baratheons so a couple of the base tactic cards um ours is the fury is a pretty decent one for them you get to choose one mode and then an additional one for controlling the crown or the the missive uh so you could get all three of these if you really wanted to they gain the attack uh well here when a friendly unit is performing a melee attack before rolling the dice okay sorry i needed to say the trigger but uh, they can gain plus one to hit, they could gain Sundering, or they could gain Vicious. So every single one of these things is good on their melee attack. They take advantage of all of it. They go from fours to hit to threes to hit. They get Sundering on the melee, which they don't have normally. And since they are very likely, if you're playing them the way you want, the way that I feel like they should be played, and your opponent's kind of treating them the way I think they're going to treat them, uh, getting Vicious is nice because you'd be attacking from that side and then getting that extra panic. Um... I think that Ours is the Fury is a card that you would see played on them quite a bit. Next up, you've got Final Strike, and this one's kind of more of a, a cheeky, funny way of saying it's good synergy with the Thorn Watch. Um, this triggers after an enemy completes an attack. Uh, for each wound the defender suffered from the attack, one enemy that they're engaged with suffers one hit. And if you control the crown, that enemy suffers neg one to the defense dice roll against these hits. So Final Strike is an interesting card in that a lot of the Baratheon stuff doesn't really die easily in one hit. Uh, you have to have a couple modifiers going for you to actually start really carving off some of these 3-plus defense saves. But the Thorn Watch, having only a 5-plus defense save, means that they might lose a couple more guys or a couple more bodies in, in a single fight or, or in a single attack. So Final Strike is kind of like a... It's a tongue-in-cheek, jokey way of me saying it synergizes with them. Their defense save is so poor that Final Strike actually becomes a lot more valuable for a Baratheon player with them on the table. And finally, I want to just mention Oath of Duty. This triggers at the start of any turn. You target one friendly combat unit and attach this card to them. And until the... Er, well, it stays there until the end of the game. And when a friendly infantry or cavalry unit is destroyed, you place one order token on the card. And then while this token is attached, they gain... Uh, this unit suffers minus one wound from failing panic tests, 
And while you control the crown, each time it performs a melee attack, the defender gains a condition token. So suffering one less wound from failed panic tests is is nice. Like, it's not a bad ability at all. But the thing that I really like here is that you're able to put a condition token on your defender every time you make a melee attack. So that could be panic if you're going into a low morale unit. It could be vulnerable if you just want to try and get that extra damage through with these guys. Because if they are locked in combat somehow, they are going to have a little bit of an issue getting out um out, well i guess they don't have an issue getting out because they just have swift retreat but this way you can uh if you wanted to try and get away from something uh but not have it you know if it's a unit that hasn't activated you can throw a weakened token on it i think oath of duty is just another really good one for the thorn watch so overall i think that the thorn watch bring some interesting stuff to a renly list because when you look at the rest of like i've mentioned it a couple times already but i'll say it again because it's so dang important that a lot of the things that Renly has available to him outside of, like, neutrals and champions of the stag, everything is very slow. And the Thorn Watch play a very tricky, fancy game and have ways to synergize with a lot of the other things that Renly's army or Renly loyalty armies are going to be bringing with them. So I think that the Thorn Watch are actually a fairly good unit. I don't know if they're, like, really high on the competitive scale, but I do think that this unit brings some really interesting variety to a Renly list and allows people to engage the game in a different way. You have like your kind of brick of butter knights moving up and then you've got the thorn watch just kind of taking off and doing their own thing like trying to play the distraction game and then while that's going on your uh, your rolling hill of butter is coming at your knights or coming at your opponent's stuff and uh, I can't say butter without knights I, d I just can't I, I love the color of the plastics on these but anyways uh, you know your thorn watcher being really annoying and your opponent has to divert resources but every resource devoted to dealing with the thorn watch is one less resource they have to deal with your heavily armored units and that can be the difference between winning and losing a table quarter or something like that so um, especially since we do have a lot of uh, scenarios in the game that want us to try to get into our opponent's uh, like area of the table, uh, whether it be Game of Thrones or Honed and Ready, I think is the one where you actually have to control quarters. And Thornwatch can actually get there and be annoying and still fight and hold their own out there with a lot of these buffs they're getting. So overall, I think the Thornwatch are a great unit, a, a wonderful addition to anyone's army who seems to be uh, interested in the Renly side. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting them on the table because they do seem like they're very uh, tricky and unique. Thanks for making it to the end of this video. I have really been enjoying the kind of restoked passion that I have for A Song of Ice and Fire, and seeing that passion kind of reinforced through the comments and views that I've been getting on the channel with this lately have just been a good way to, or it's been good for me to kind of support my motivation going forward, especially since we've got a big old brick of releases to get through, and it seems like that's not going to be changing anytime soon. So, uh, I'm, I'm just happy to be, you know, finding some kind of value or happiness in doing this kind of stuff again. It's been a, a great time, and uh, I just wanted to take a moment to thank everyone for uh, all the support they've shown on the channel.